Welcome to Homemaking with Denise. I've been a homemaker for more than 50 years and I think I've got a pretty good handle on how to make ends meet, particularly when it comes to putting healthy and delicious meals on the table. However, I was recently issued a challenge to do a $30 grocery budget challenge and this $30 was for the month. And to make it even spicier, I was to consider using SNAP benefits for this challenge. So I made a meal plan, a shopping list, and I went to Walmart. And if you missed the video where I actually shared the grocery haul and then made the first of the five recipes from that grocery haul, I will link it in the description box below so that you can check that out. But in this particular video, I am sharing with you four of the meals that I made with food from that grocery haul. And I'll also share with you some lessons that I've learned throughout the process. The first meal that I made in this video was a chicken pot pie. Now pot pies are healthy and they are nutritious. They usually serve six and I was going to use one fourth of the chicken that I had portioned out from the chicken that I bought during the grocery haul. To get started, I cut up the vegetables. I plan to use one of the carrots, two stalks of the celery, and about a third of the onion I picked up during the grocery haul. I made sure to save the peelings and scraps of the veggies to make broth later. This video is brought to you by Apron Diva. Pretty and practical, we believe that an apron can be a homemaker's best accessory. Visit us at www.aprondiva.com. And for this pot pie, I'm using a cup of homemade chicken broth as my budget did not allow me to buy any. I add the veggies to the broth and simmer them on high until tender.
Then I added two tablespoons of chicken, better than bouillon, which I had in my refrigerator. While the veggies were simmering, I worked on the sauce, which included whisking one quarter cup of flour into 12 ounces of evaporated milk. The evaporated milk and the flour were pulled from my pantry shelf. They did not come from the grocery haul. Then I poured the milk mixture into the simmering veggies and cooked until it began to thicken. In the meantime, I needed to get the pie crust ready. I had a box of pre-made pie crusts in the fridge that had been in there for a while, so I thought I'd use that. Then I went back to the pie filling to add in two teaspoons of poetry seasoning, some black pepper, and the cup and a half of chicken that I had portioned out for this meal. I also added in a cup of frozen mixed vegetables, which did come from the grocery haul. I let that simmer on low until it thickened, then I set it off the heat and went back to the pie crust. That's where it got tricky. The pie crust had been in the fridge for a while. It was dry and brittle and kept breaking up. I decided the simplest thing to do was to make a lattice crust. Lattice crusts are forgiving and easily hide imperfections. Now here's a pro tip. Always put a baking sheet under casserole dishes just in case they bubble over. You do not want to have a mess to clean up in your oven. Been there, done that. Learn the lesson the hard way, so always use a baking sheet or an oven liner. I'm using both.
I put the pie in the oven to bake at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for about 35 minutes. You want the sauce to be bubbling and the crust to be golden brown. When you take it out of the oven, let it sit for about 15 minutes. So, we had this chicken pot pie for dinner last night and it was absolutely positively delicious, but I used that lattice crust on top of the pot pie, as I said earlier, because I had it in the fridge for a while and it was a little dry and it kept cracking apart. Then I had an epiphany while we were having dinner. I thought, you know, what would be really good on top of that would be a biscuit crust. And if you homemakers have flour, baking powder, and that kind of thing at home, you can make your own biscuit crust or you know when you go to Bob Evans and you get a pot pie and they have this cute little or kind of soft little kind of a, a cobbler type crust on it? I thought, boom, that would be really great. So, I whipped up, this because this is all we've got left. Because my husband had some for lunch. He had a couple servings for dinner. This is supposed to serve six, by the way. So, and what's in here will serve two. So I thought, why don't I just whip up, like just like a little kind of a cobbler or a biscuit kind of crust that'll just like sit on top of that. I thought that would be so good. Now, I will admit, I did put just a bit more sugar in the crust than I, or shall I say the topping, than I normally would because I wanted it to be just a teensy weensy bit sweet. Almost kind of like those um, strawberry shortcake toppings that you make. Or you could even do pancake batter. Pancake batter would be just fine because this is about the consistency of pancake batter. Now I'm going to put this in the oven on 400 degrees because all I need to have happen is for the crust to cook. And while this topping or crust cooks, the bottom part will just heat. So let's get that in the oven. So I set the timer on the oven for about 15 minutes. That's about as long as it takes maybe biscuits to rise and to cook through. So we'll see how that does. But mm, 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 that chicken pot pie was so good last night and I'm thinking that this kind of a biscuit cobbler type crust is going to make it all the more delicious. And here's the things moms and dads, you have got to learn to cook. And I say moms and dads because my son does a lot of cooking at his house and I know there are a lot of other men who do a lot of cooking at their house. So homemakers, moms, dads, Everyone needs to learn how to cook and you need to learn how to make things like biscuits and pancakes and that kind of thing. But more on that later. As you can see, I got my laundry lab uniform on because I'm doing laundry today, but it was like I had that epiphany and I just had to share. So when that comes out, I'll let you see it. Oh, look at there. Now that's what I'm talking about right there. It's a little light right there, but now let's take a look. It's cooked through. Oh yeah. Look at there. Just look at that. Mm, 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 mm. Now this dish is served too. Let me show you some other little dishes. I have some smaller ones like this. These will be perfect serving sizes for children, but I didn't think that one of these would be enough for an adult. So that's why I put it in this dish and then you can cut it in half or 
or my hubby, he might eat the whole thing. So there's that to think about. Mm -mm 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 -mm. And you can see right there where the topping did cook all the way through. So yeah. So you can make biscuit dough, roll it really thin, spread it over the top, or whip up a batter, whip up a batch of pancake mix and pour a little bit of pancake batter over the top and let it rise and cook and that can do the same thing. So yeah. Today I'm making chicken stew and it's another one of our $30 food stamp budget meals. And chicken stew is very hearty, it is very flavorful, it is very delicious and it is definitely filling. And the nice thing about a chicken stew recipe is that it usually serves six. So once I get this chicken stew done, I'm going to portion some of it off and put it in the freezer so that we can have some for another time. What will we be using? Well, of course, you know, I've got the chicken that I've portioned out from before. And then I'm going to be using two of the carrots. We've got three. We had three left. These are two. We've got one left. So two of the carrots, some of the celery, and then this is all of the onion left from that big onion that I purchased in our $30 budget. And for the potatoes in the stew, I'm going to be using these southern hash browns, which are the little square potatoes that will be perfect in the chicken stew. So, oh, and then we'll have a variety of spices. And most of these are spices that I have dried, preserved, and then repurpose these jars. I will be needing some fresh parsley at the very end, but I'll clip that when it's time. So let's get this started. As always, when you prep your veggies, be sure to give them a good scrub and then save the peelings and scraps for a do-it-yourself broth. I really like using this caraway Dutch oven when making soups, stews, and dumplings because I just like the way it cooks them. I can saute my veggies and put a bloom on my spices while using very little oil.
The Southern style hash brown potatoes did come from the grocery haul, but the flour, the spices, the chicken broth, and the chicken better than bouillon did not. These were things that I already had in my freezer, my fridge, or in my pantry. To make this meal stretch and to be more hearty, I decided to make biscuits. I'm sorry I lost the footage of me actually making the dough, but you can see where I handled it just a bit and then rolled it out. The important thing here is not to roll the dough too thin. I like light fluffy biscuits, so a half inch to three quarters inch is good. Pop them in the oven at 425 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes, but keep an eye on them. Every oven is different. I like for my stews to have a thick gravy and my secret is to add a couple of tablespoons of mashed potato flakes. You can use flour or cornstarch, but you get more nutritional value with the potato flakes. The biscuits turned out nicely and were a great addition to our supper. I like to serve pear preserves or chunky applesauce with them. It provides a little sweets and serves as a meal extender. So I'm back again with another installment on the $30 budget. And I have learned some very interesting things as I've been working through this particular process. 
And if you recall from my $30 grocery haul, I was planning to make a classic shepherd's pie or cottage pie. I'm going to make the one with the ground beef, but I'm calling it shepherd's pie. And you have mashed potatoes on top, but I could not buy the box mashed potatoes or the fresh mashed potatoes and make all the different things that I wanted because I also have chicken stew on deck to make. So I bought these southern hash browns and I thought I would use those in place of the mashed potatoes. There's my oven heating up and I thought I would use those in place of the mashed potatoes and they come in these nice little cubes so I'm kind of pleased with that so I will use these to layer on top of my shepherd's pie so I put them in the dish like this just so I would have an idea of about how many I would need and then the rest of these I am going to save for the chicken stew because I need potatoes for those so what I found is that it's very difficult not only to eat healthy, but to eat fresh when you're on a very limited budget. The other thing that this recipe calls for is a cup of frozen corn. And you guys will recall that I bought a can of corn for in the grocery haul. And it's been several days since I did that, so I've already used up that can of corn. And I do, though, have some corn here that I had in the freezer that I put up myself. So I'll get a, about a cup of corn out of that. So I'll use this. And I'm probably going to add a few more veggies than is called for just because I have less meat. Oh, and you know, I bought a pound of ground beef for this shepherd's pie and for um, a couple of the other dishes I was going to make. I think it was, might have been tacos, I'm not sure, but I got the list somewhere. But I decided to cut the pound of ground beef in half instead of into thirds because I really like the shepherd's pie to be really rich. So I'm going to use half of it in this. And then we'll see how much I put in the other recipes. Now, when I made the chicken tortilla soup, and I only used like one quarter of that chicken in that soup, my husband said the chicken's pretty good, but he did notice there wasn't quite as much meat. And with the shepherd's pie, one of the really rich things about it is the ground beef or the ground lamb. So I thought I'm going to go with a half a pound this time. So I'm going to go ahead and put these in the microwave, let them thaw out so that I can do what I need to do with them to get them on top. Because they need to be relatively warm when I put them on top of the... When I put them on top of the mixture. So I got out some extra green beans, so I probably have about a cup, maybe a cup and a quarter left of these frozen mixed vegetables. I need a cup of these and the cup of corn. So we'll see if I need any of these green beans at all, which I already had in the freezer. And um, we'll get it started. So the first thing I'm gonna to need to do is to get my onion chopped up and to get my ground, my ground beef ground. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that started. And one of the things that I'm doing is that if I'm going to cut down on the meat, then I'm going up on the veggies just to make it just a little bit more hearty. And I only remember I only bought one kind of large onion. So this was the part that I cut the other day when I used it. So I'll get it cut up now. I've certainly been a lot more frugal than I had been previously. I've been forced to think about it. And it's really been good for me to do that. So what I'll end up doing first is you kind of make this in two parts. You make the meat filling, 
then you make the potato topping, and then you assemble the casserole, is I'll make the meat filling first, and that will include sauteing the onion, and then browning the ground beef, adding some spices and things like that. And I can already see this is only about a half cup, so I'm gonna need some more of this onion. I'll take that much more of it. And I'll save this part for another meal. Let's get this over here. So I got out my caraway cookware and it's hot. So I'll add a couple of teaspoons of oil as requested. So hot pot, then you add the oil and then I'll add my onion. Now I'm going to add the ground beef in here. And let's get it all broken apart. Getting this ground beef brown. The onions are smelling so aromatic. Now I'm going to add one teaspoon of rosemary, one teaspoon of dried thyme, two teaspoons of dried parsley, and this is parsley and thyme that I have dried myself. Half a teaspoon of salt and about a quarter teaspoon of black, well a half a teaspoon of black pepper. I usually cut back on the pepper but when I think about that all those potatoes and other veggies that are going in here that half a teaspoon of black pepper ought to be fine. So this is the half a pound of ground beef. And keeping in mind that this shepherd's pie should serve six. So this can be for several dinners or lunches. So part of this will go in the freezer for our person who has really got a limited food budget this month. They are really food insecure. And really this is a dish that doesn't take a lot to put together. So now I need to add a tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce and two cloves of garlic minced. And I've got this garlic that's already minced and cut up that I had in the fridge. So I'm going to use that because I was not able to buy garlic when I picked up my groceries. I'm going to let this cook for about a minute. And then I need to add two tablespoons of all-purpose flour. Right now I've got whole wheat, so that's what's going in. We'll give that a stir. And we'll cook that flour off so you don't get that floury taste. Now I'll add the tomato paste. And with the tomato paste, Whenever I open a can and you only need one or two tablespoons, you have all that's left. So I usually will section off the rest of it in one or two tablespoon measures and then put it in the freezer. Then I can just grab one out when I need it. So this is two tablespoons of tomato paste.
Now I'm going to add some extra green beans in here just because I want to make this a little bit more hearty. Since I have less meat, I am going with more vegetables. So now I'm going to work on the potato mixture and that calls for a stick of butter which luckily I already had in my fridge. A half a cup of half and half but all I've got is milk so I'm using that 2% milk we got. Half a teaspoon of garlic powder. Half a teaspoon of salt. And one fourth teaspoon of pepper. So I'm going to give that a good stir. I think I'm liking the size of these potatoes. I just hope I have enough. Then I add in a quarter cup of Parmesan cheese and I just happen to have that Parmesan cheese in the fridge. Otherwise it wouldn't have been in there. And this caraway pan is really getting this heated up but it's not sticking. Look how it's slipping around in there. I'm liking that. Okay, I'm going to set that off. So now I'm going to assemble the casserole, which means I'm going to put this in this dish. And notice it just slid right out of the pan. Oh, and look at the bottom of my caraway cookware. I've had this for a couple of years now and it still looks pretty good. But then I work with my cookware. I make sure they look that way. So I'm getting this spread out on the bottom and I decided to use this dish, this Darwin baking dish, instead of using a deep dish pie because I wanted to make sure that it didn't bubble over the top. Now I'll put the potatoes on top. And it looks like it ought to give me a nice little layer. And then look how they just slid out the pot. Hmm. This wasn't meant to be a look at my caraway, but I couldn't help it. Sorry. Now the last time I made a shepherd's pie, I did not do the Parmesan cheese. But I have made mashed potatoes before where I used the Parmesan cheese. So I thought since I have that in there, might as well use it up. And this is a nice hearty dish. Now something else I could have considered doing too is putting it in individual little casserole dishes so that I could just automatically put a couple in the freezer like I could have baked it that way. Like I've got a couple of casserole dishes like this that I could have tried that. And then some people have some of those other little um, round baking dishes that are just a little bit larger and yeah, this looks pretty good now just in case it does bubble up and bubble over I'm going to set it on this baking sheet only because I've had enough mishaps to happen to know that I need to consider putting it on a baking sheet
Now the oven has been set to 400 and I'm going to let it bake for about 45 to 50 minutes. Since all the different pieces are heated all the way through, the meat mixture has been cooked and heated, the potatoes are cooked and heated, I just need it to heat all the way through and then for the meat filling to kind of bubble up all around. So that'll take about 40 to 45 minutes. So I'll come back and let you see what it's looking like. In the meantime, I'll get this stuff cleaned up. So I actually baked this for about 35 minutes and then I let it sit on top of the stove for about 15 minutes so it can cool off. That way hopefully when I dig into it, it should hold together just a little bit. And this is just looking absolutely marvelous. Just absolutely marvelous. So let me go ahead and get it plated up. I want to get a nice big, now this is supposed to serve six, just as a reminder. Maybe I could have let it sit a little bit longer. So here you go. It looks really good. Now let's give it a taste. It kind of has a look to me a little bit of a ground beef stew, but let's just give it a taste. This is really good. And I think the Parmesan cheese added just that little bit of a snap to those mash, well, to those hash browns. And the hash browns worked out nicely. The fact that they were cubed made them work out nicely. So I'm making my husband's plate mate and we're gonna go ahead and have our dinner. It's Taco Tuesday, so today we're having a taco bowl for dinner. I start with the remaining half pound of ground beef and the last bit of the onion from our grocery haul.
I brown the ground beef and drain it, reserving the pan drippings. I return the ground beef to the skillet and then throw in the onions. Once the onions begin to soften, I add in a little green pepper that I pulled from my garden. I cook these until tender. Then it was time to add the taco seasoning. I gave that a good stir and then added in a cup of the pasta sauce that I picked up in the grocery haul. I gave all that a good stir. Let it simmer for a few minutes Then set it off the heat while I prepared the rice. Rice is pretty easy to cook as long as you follow the directions and keep an eye on it. Once it's done, remove it from the heat, let it sit for about 5 minutes and then fluff it with a spoon or a fork. So now to assemble my taco bowl. And I could have left the meat out altogether since I was going to be using the black beans and the garbanzo beans, but I like the combination of them both. And I also like the addition of a little bit of corn on top. That just will make the dish that much heartier. And I will squeeze a little bit of lime juice over the top that just gives it that taco flavor. My husband has some tortilla chips in the pantry, so I used a couple of those. So here is my taco bowl. And I started with a bed of rice with the taco meat seasoning on top and then sprinkled that with the corn, the black beans, and the garbanzo beans.
Now a little sour cream or guacamole on top would be nice, but I don't have any of those. A little bit of Mexican style cheese or taco cheese would be fine on top of that as well. Don't have any of that because I wasn't able to get any of that on the grocery haul. But this is another meal that would certainly, certainly last for several days. I divided the taco meat up into five different portions and I cooked one cup of rice with two cups of water which gives me two cups of rice which will certainly go pretty far with a meal such as this. So I can have more taco bowls in the upcoming days or I could use some of the rice for breakfast. So what have I learned from this challenge? Well, truth be told, I have learned a lot. First of all, I learned that you cannot buy hot foods on SNAP benefits. So the rotisserie chicken that I bought, you couldn't buy hot. However, I bought that chicken cold in the deli. So if the chicken is a day old, sold in the deli as a cold product, many times you can get those with your SNAP benefits. The other thing is that people were quick to point out that SNAP benefits are not meant to replace your food budget. They are meant to supplement what you already have. Thus the term Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. I didn't know that. I thought SNAP benefits were to replace your entire food budget and that is not the case. Many of the people that left comments on my ultimate $30 grocery haul challenge, surviving on $30 of SNAP benefits, actually were people who used SNAP benefits. And many of them said that they had more month left over at the end of the money. So they didn't see SNAP benefits as an entitlement program. They saw SNAP benefits as a lifesaver. There are three powerful lessons that I learned from this experience and lesson number one is that you must have a pantry to pull from. I cannot overemphasize the importance of having flour and sugar and various spices and tomato products and things that you can make a meal with that are already on your pantry shelf so that you've got something to tide you over in case of hard times. The cheddar cheese biscuits that I made in this video and the corn muffins that I made in the last video were meal extenders and I made those things using products that I already had on my pantry shelf. And then the pear preserves and the chunky applesauce also helped to round out the meal. It provided a sweet and nobody left the table hungry. Lesson number two is that your freezer can be your best friend. When you make a meal that serves six to eight and your family is only going to use four or five of those servings, right away portion out some of those meals into freezer dishes and put them in the freezer so that number one, you don't have to eat the same thing every day and number two, you've got something to pull from later in the month when you want to switch things up. And lesson number three is homemakers, you have got to learn to make things. You've got to learn to make muffins and biscuits and pancakes and even cakes and cookies and things like that so that you can make things for your family at a lot less cost. If you've got these basics in your pantry, then you can make these things to extend your meals and your family won't feel deprived at all. And here's something else. If you're living on a limited food budget, I encourage you to take advantage of food banks, and food pantries in your community. Contact your township trustee's office and see what services they have available. Don't be too prideful to take advantage of these kind of services and then use your SNAP benefits to augment what you've been able to pick up from these other resources. As the friend or family member of someone living with food insecurity, there's a couple things you can do to help. One, could be to provide a ride to the food bank, to the food pantry, if they're unable to get there on their own. The other thing you can do is put together a blessing box. And I learned about a blessing box from my friend Mary at Mary's Nest. But a blessing box is where you buy some things like maybe milk, bread, eggs, cheese, butter, 
some fruits and vegetables and you put these things in a box and you bless them with it. Or you could ask them what they need, pick those things up and put them in the box. Or you could buy a gift card from the grocery store. I know Kroger's has Kroger gift cards that you can buy and share with them in that way. And there may be other ways to help that I haven't even thought of. What resonated with you most from either the ultimate $30 grocery haul challenge or today's video where I shared with you four of the meals that I actually made from that grocery haul? Tell me in the comment section below. And to see more budget-friendly meals, particularly how I make my chicken and dumplings from scratch, just tap or click the link on the screen.